Welcome everyone. I'm Kim Bremer, your host today for another edition of Bova News, keeping you up to date on the cattle industry's latest in technology, management, genetics, and more. It's an understatement to say that genetics are an important part of any dairy operation. In the past, genetic progress was relatively slow and centered on making mating and selection decisions based on limited data. Today, genetic progress can be made at a much faster rate thanks to new technology advancements. In this Bova News webinar, we will hear from four dairy producers who have not only accelerated the genetics of their herd, but are key in developing and providing elite genetics for the dairy industry as a whole. John Benick owns North Florida Holsteins in Bell, Florida, which is home to 12,000 head of cattle and 3,000 acres. Those 12,000 head are made up of 6,500 milking age cows, 4,200 replacements, and the balance are steers, beef cattle, and bulls. Currently, Don is a director and member of the Executive Committee and Transportation Committee Chairman of Southeast Milk Incorporated, and he's a director of Southeast DHIA. Past director positions and offices have been numerous on various cooperative, corporate, and college boards. Welcome, Don. Thank you very much. Uh and really appreciate uh, the Boba News folks uh, for putting this program together, uh, particularly uh, with the status of uh, the three other speakers that are with me. Uh, uh, by coincidence, uh, all three of them have had a major influence uh, uh, on our herd uh, uh, through the uh, genetics they've developed and and we've certainly uh, used substantial numbers uh, of, of bulls that uh, were influenced by them. Uh, starting out with this first slide, this is one oh, that Maggie Murphy took probably 15 years ago and what it is is an old excellent Rudolph uh, you see standing here in front of uh, uh, seven tankers of milk. She had recently uh, completed the 350,000 pounds of milk that it took to fill those seven tankers. And she uh, sort of is a, a, shows a lot of what we're trying to do, and that's uh, to have rugged, uh, uh, long-wearing cattle uh, that uh, produce at a high level. And she spent her whole life... Uh, out uh, in the free stalls with all the other cows, uh, uh, no special treatment. And uh, uh, she just uh, uh, emphasizes uh, uh, what uh, uh, we, we are trying to develop. Uh, this uh, is just a little bit of uh, the uh, genetic trends and this, these slides are getting a little old. The two on the top uh, show uh, the major increases uh, uh, that we saw, the one that on the left uh, in production in that period of time, and the one on the right, uh, the major improvements in type. Uh, but what happened is we look in the lower left, we took extreme drops in fertility and uh, uh, our average months in the herd dropped substantially and these are a lot of the things we've tried to breed away from. We feel the, uh, the upper left-hand slide, uh, that was a, a great improvement in production, but in that era, uh, people thought uh, uh, that the heritability of fertility uh, was so low, it wasn't worth watching. And, and what we ended up with was, uh, and, and we really emphasized uh, uh, two-year-old production, but what we ended up with is the very highest producing animals are the ones that didn't breed back, which really was a lot of their high production, not just their natural, that uh, they weren't carrying a calf uh, for that whole first year. And, uh, uh, as a result, uh, ended up uh, with the high production, but uh, because they were genetically infertile, uh, we uh, uh, saw what what happened in the lower left-hand corner, and and we're we've kind of used this uh, 
is an example of the basis of the uh, uh, direction we wish to go. This next uh, slide is one that uh, I plagiarized from uh, a, what I consider uh, probably the best cowman I ever knew, and that was Pete Blodgett. Most of you folks uh, uh, knew Pete, but you would have called him a, 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 a considerably older than yourselves. But those of you that had contact with Pete uh, uh, knew what a uh, great and practical cowman uh, he was. As you can see, uh, uh, this, this looks like exactly the same thing that a lot of our uh, more practical genetics people are pushing today, uh, the, the, the health traits and things, whereas the rest of AI was going the direction uh, of, of the slides that we just left. And as you, you see uh, uh, in this 20 or 30 year old slide, he's saying we need more pregnant cows and heifers. We need, uh, we need live calves on the ground, less stillbirths. Uh, we need cows that maintain their body weight. We need cows that basically hold the same level of body weight year round, whether they're, uh, they're peaking uh, or uh, whether they're dry, that uh, they hold their body condition, that they don't get thin. And of course, we want fewer dead cows and cows with more vigor and fire in their belly, as he called it. Uh, healthy udders, low somatic cell, uh, mobility, and just general over trouble-free cows. And uh, Pete, in, uh, uh, in addition to being a, a really good friend, was also a, uh, had a significant uh, effect on uh, how we think cattle should be bred. Uh, and, and one of the things that in uh, that we learn early in a genetics course that the uh, fewer things we breed for, the more progress we make. That make sure we emphasize what we really need. Something that I would criticize current indexes for is we're breeding for too darn many things. And uh, the really important things that we need uh, receive a relatively low level uh, on, uh, in the index uh, uh, to, so that we can cover this number of things we want. In our opinion, we need to pick just a few things and place our emphasis there. And if the animals uh, show up with some things we don't like, we can uh, uh, remove them. But uh, uh, we don't like a whole list of, of things uh, uh, that we're breeding for in an index. Uh, and and the, th the goals and the things we really stress are the high levels of high com component milk, productive life and livability, all the uh, fertility traits, low levels of mastitis, uh, sire and daughter calving ease, and sire and daughter stillbirth are, are things that are real important to us in our index. And we don't like to go an awful lot beyond this in, in the things that uh, uh, we put uh, particular emphasis on. Uh, and we, we, we heard from in the show ring and by classifiers, uh, bigger, taller, sharper forever. Uh, and we just, uh, listen to judges, there's a particularly judging heifer calves. She's at the top of the class because she's bigger, taller, and sharper. Uh, and in our opinion, uh, this uh, relates in uh, going this direction, relates in a higher uh, rate of culling, a higher health costs, more DAs, more locomotion problems, more respiratory and other problems and a higher injury rate uh, to both themselves and their herd mates that uh, uh, when, uh, you know, being bigger and taller, they're a lot more to fall, uh, apt to fall down. And if they fall down, it's harder for them to get up. And when you've got a whole bunch of cows in the same pen, uh, 
uh, they're all synced to come and heat together. All the big ones are jumping on, uh, on the small ones and that kind of thing. And is be has become uh, very obvious in some of the current things that are being uh, uh, tried to put into uh, proofs that these bigger cattle, these bigger, taller cattle uh, as a group are much less feed efficient. Uh, the, uh, th this is a, a slide that was put together, oh boy, 20 or 30 years ago. And this was actually done, uh, was financed uh, by Holstein uh, at the time, but this was reported in Dairy Science Journal in the kinds of, uh, and, and there in the, uh, the head researchers were, uh, uh, were Tom Lawler, uh, who all of you know, uh, of course, is Holstein's geneticist for many years. Uh, Gary Rogers, who at that time was um, uh, head of the head dairy scientist at the University of Tennessee and was well recognized for that. And then uh, the, uh, the person coming up, finishing up their PhD on this was Chad Dekow, who all of you know is uh, Penn State's uh, head dairy scientist and uh, writes a very uh, functional cobble, column in Horace Dairyman. But as you can see, the relative, the, the, the bottom line, the x-axis is, 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 uh, is uh, uh, the relative, uh, the, uh, the score on, uh, the classification, uh, and, uh, the, uh, the risk of culling of this group is the sharper these cows got, uh, the more apt they were to, uh, get culled. And so the cows that were getting the highest classification for so-called dairy farm and dairy cat character uh, were the uh, uh, cows leaving the herd uh, uh, the earliest and obviously, uh, although published in Dairy Science Journal, this did not get published a lot because it uh, was not exactly pro-classification. Uh, and this is uh, talking about the, the sharper kind of cattle and this is, Pretty, this is pretty well documented in scientific re research that sharper cattle have a lower herd life, they have a higher disease level, they have lower conception, they don't come in heat as often. Uh, if, if any of you ever have studied the digital foot pad, the thickness of the dead digital foot pad is tied to the body condition a cow uh, carries and uh, Sharper, thinner cows are much more apt to get lame. Israeli work shows that they tend to have uh, uh, higher somatic cells. And all of us know uh, that these kind of cattle, uh, when we finally have to uh, ship them, uh, uh, bring in total uh, less revenue. Uh, this is a slide of a, uh, a work that was done uh, at... at uh, by Les Hansen and group uh, uh, at the University of Minnesota. And obviously uh, Les carries quite different opinions than, than many, but one of the things uh, that he did, uh, and, and this was reported in the journals, is he found all the studies uh, that he could find of what shape body forms and shapes uh, were the, were the cattle that stayed around the longest. And it was a substantial pool he had and he put all this in the, the computer. Well, the, uh, uh, the, the figure on the left uh, is what uh, uh, was the ideal type cow. And of course, this is looking at cows from the front end, the ideal type cow uh, uh, from Holstein at the time, the, uh, the cows that were winning the shows and, and so forth. Uh, and the cows on the right were in his study and analyzing uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
the, the basic forms of the kind of cattle that stayed around the longest and stayed in the herd the longest uh, uh, from, from all of these uh, papers that he had to work with uh, ended up being the cow on the right. Uh, uh, and so uh, it, it, it certainly took away uh, uh, the desire to uh, uh, go to these sharper, more refined cattle. Uh, this, this is a, uh, some of the kinds of cattle uh, uh, we, we try to develop. And, and this was a two-year-old heifer uh, who had milked uh, over a year, still giving uh, 120 pounds of milk. In fact, she calved it either 21 or two months. But notice, she doesn't have that long, lean neck. She's sharp, she, or she's strong, she's tough, she's rugged, still has a, uh, 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 or, or, uh, she's left the herd now, but maintained a real good udder to the end. And uh, Greg, as you know, uh, uh, you bought a daughter of hers uh, in, uh, in the national convention sale that I know you at least marketed a bull, uh, to uh, ABS from, but but she sure, uh, uh, we, we like these uh, uh, really rugged cattle that hold their body condition, as you can say. This is a cow that's still given uh, 100 and some pounds at the time of this. This is, she's in like her 11th or 12th month of milking and, and holding her body condition. And uh, that that's the direction we're trying to go. So what we're saying is we need feed efficiency, we need low maintenance, we need high production, we need high components, and we need high fertility. Uh, this is a full sister to the cow we were just looking at. And uh, uh, Mark, uh, old buddy, you bought a, a heifer out of her uh, in one of your sales. And I know I've seen at least a, a bull or two at select that you marketed from this, but uh, she's just like her litter mate sister uh, and, and happens to be, of course, out of the uh, super sire bull that uh, uh, Greg uh, 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 developed uh, and so forth. But th this general strength, this tendency to not get sharp, but, but be tough and rugged and and uh, uh, hold up in the day-to-day -day stress of uh, the environments we put them under our life and death to us. And so uh, uh, this is uh, uh, my, my last slide, but one of the things I haven't emphasized that I, I think one of the things as an industry we're doing is way too much inbreeding and we really are trying to get away from inbreeding. I don't, I don't think the detriment is, is shown up in the level of inbreeding we're doing yet because you really, all the things that go uh, with high levels of inbreeding as far as lower fertility and less disease resistance and, and all, all the things that have to do with calf health and thriftiness and all these kind of things are hampered by inbreeding. Uh, and we're not seeing it until as the animals get more mature, if we're just uh, making our decisions from sets that are being done on uh, heifers uh, while they're still two-year-olds, I, I don't place a lot of meaning in that, but uh, this kind of, uh, our, our focus in our index with relatively uh, few uh, 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 characteristics that we're breeding for are fat and protein, productive life and livability, heifer and cow conception rate, somatic cell, sire and daughter calving needs, and sire and daughter stillbirth. Thank you. Appreciate your patience. Thank you, Don. Our next presenter is Greg Anderson. Greg's a managing partner at Seagull Bay Dairy in American Falls, Idaho, and Anderson Dairy in Declo, Idaho. Greg's parents, Alan and Norma, brother Ben and sister Heather are also active partners in the dairies with a combined herd of 2,500 cows. 
Also, the Anderson family are one of three partners in Winstar Genetics. Winstar Genetics owns an elite group of Holstein donors and breeds high total merit males and females for global dairy genetic companies, breeders, and producers. Welcome, Craig. Hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to be here, and uh, it's an honor to be on a panel with uh, Don and Alicia and Mark. Um, uh, respect all of all of them and their contribution to the progress of uh, dairy and uh, and the genetics business. So, um, as I said in the introduction, yeah, with Seagull Bay Dairy, uh, just a brief history and summary. Uh, established in 1980 by my parents, Alan and Norma. Um, then in 2005, we we bought a dairy in Declo, which is 50 miles away. My brother Ben and his wife Robbie live there, um, along with my wife Gwen. We live here at the Seagull Bay Dairy location, and then our uh, younger sister Heather is also uh, part of our management and ownership team. So uh, here's a picture of Anderson Dairy. Um, that parlor was built in uh, 2016. You see the three freestall barns there, um, and then. Uh, Here's the uh, here's Seagull Bay Dairy. There's our Shauna cow out in front. She's the dam of Super Sire, um, and she's in uh, the pedigree of a lot of the the top sires you see today. And so she's been uh, she's been a favorite for us. Um, that parlor at Seagull Bay we built in 2015. Now on to Winstar Genetics. It's a group with three partners, uh, Seagull Bay Dairy and uh, our family, our partners there. Uh, Cannon Dairy is owned by Seth Cannon and his family. And then my older brother, John, is also a partner in Winstar and uh, he's, uh, he had Triple Crown Genetics. But now together we've, uh, we've formed Winstar Genetics in uh, 2017. So we're just into our fourth year with this partnership. So our breeding goals uh, derive from economic incentives, of course. I mean, that's uh, we, we want to breed for what we find to be economically uh, uh, important. And so uh, pounds of fat and protein top the list for us. Um, the fitness traits, uh, especially fertility and longevity, but uh, we also, uh, you know, select for calving ability. We want live calves and smooth transitions. Uh, we want to try to keep those herd replacement costs in check. Um, and of course, we, we need live calves for uh, replacements or for uh, other revenue streams and sales of excess cattle or, or beef cattle. So um, also, we look at utility. Um, you know, I define that in these, these terms, moderate stature, adequate width, healthy body condition, and then also correct T placement and length. Um, I think those are, those are f the few linear traits we'll look at, uh, stature, T placement, T length. And then other traits that are gaining more reliability, um, and we're learning more about these traits, but hoof health, uh, disease resistance, and then the, uh, the casings I think are also important. So here's a picture of a few cows. Uh, I mean, for us, performance is more important than appearance. Uh, however, uh, what kind of look should a modern dairy cow have? And so here's a few examples uh, that we that I'd show here. The three the three on the bottom are first lactation animals, uh, and you see they're they're uh, they have adequate width, uh, moderate size, but they also possess that uh, healthy body condition. Um, the one cow on the the bottom left, you know, the one you'd nitpick her with her short teats, um, but that's uh, other than that, she she's got the width and and the the kind of look we'd like to see in a in a young cow, and then the cow on the top is is a more mature cow, but you just love that T placement on her, and then she's also got the adequate width uh, in the front and in the rear, uh, track straight from behind. I mean, we'd use words like uh, athletic. We want an athletic cow that's mobile, um, but also that uh, is uh, is able to produce a lot of milk while still um, maintaining that healthy body condition. 
Um, you know, it used to be, as Don mentioned, you know, we thought we had to have a cow that was sharp and angular and uh, had all the, all the dairy quality to her to be able to produce a lot of milk. But to today, really, can a cow maintain body condition and produce a lot of milk? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, you see, here's a few cows on the rotary. You see that width in the front end. Um, that's what we like. And then here from the rear, we've got uh, a few others. The young cows there, um, like I say, maybe the teats are a little, little short, but that's admittedly a spot where we'd like to improve and the breed needs to improve a little on that. Uh, you'll notice here we've got different colors of cattle. Um, the traits are really more important than uh, the color to us. Um, here's a couple more cows, uh, young cows. Um, you know, traditionally people would say these cows don't have enough body depth um, or extreme openness. Um, we don't uh, think that's a limiting factor to breed progress. Uh, these cows here, um, I, the one on the left in her third lactation, she's made above average uh, lactations. I mean, you're talking 109, 110% relative value. Um, and she did that while maintaining body condition. Cow on the right's in her second lactation and uh, she made a heck of a two-year-old record uh, bred back. And so what we wanna be able to do is keep repeating that. And so those two have been donors at Windstar. And those are the kind of cattle that we, we want to uh, uh, make more of. Uh, so here's a little more on Windstar genetics. Um, our breeding goals and plan here, we, we work with elite total merit Holsteins, um, focuses on high net merit, but the emphasis is on production and fitness. Um, you know, just a few stats on the donor pool. We have about 50 donors we work each month. Um, most of these are young animals uh, between, you know, the youngest are nine months. And, uh, and then we do have some two-year-olds that we, we do work with that are, are exceptional. Um, and we use mostly IVF for our repro. Um, and uh, we try to place uh, as many embryos as we can fresh. So what are, what are some of the results we're seeing? So on our, on our Windstar Genetics Group, we're focused on the very top end. We're looking for the outliers that, that will be bull dams and uh, will uh, we'll be in that top, you know, uh, one-tenth to one percent of the breed. Um, so that's, we've, we do believe it's possible, though, to increase production and longevity uh, simultaneously. So that's why the, the focus on production and fitness. Um, if you look at our, our active donors, um, if I put our donors into three groups, uh, we have those that are active and there's 64 of those. We do have 13 of those that are polled. Uh, that's another trait that uh, we're trying to bring into the top, uh, the top categories in uh, total merit uh, Holsteins. Uh, but you see that group averages 817 net merit. 148 combined fat and protein and 5.5 productive life. If you go to that next group, you know, in, in genetic improvement, you know, theoretically you want your youngest groups to be the highest genetic merit group that you have. So you go to the next group that's, those are not quite old enough to work, um, three, three months to eight months old, um, 35 head there, one of those is pulled, uh, but the average is 847. So, you know, we jump a uh, 30 net merit dollars in that group with a little more production, a little more productive life. And uh, then the youngest group, those are just the young calves that are uh, just getting genomic results, but uh, that group averages 868 net merit with 167 uh, combined fat and protein. And then if you look at the range, um, you know, some of those young heifers are, are over a thousand net merit. And uh, so, so we're trying to uh, stay at the upper levels um, with our genetic program, but the real benefit of that comes, you know, in, into the commercial producer uh, the way I see it, um, 
let me go to this next group. Here's here's something to consider: groups versus individuals. Um, you know, you, you hear often about, hey, I got a genomic test on this animal and she didn't, you know, she was supposed to be my best performer and she wasn't. Well, here's, here's the question to consider. Using genomic testing, can I identify my best cow? And uh, the answer to that I'd say is maybe. Another question is, can I identify my top 2%? And there I'd say again, maybe, but more likely. Um, then the other question would be, can I identify my top 20%? How about my top 50%? And on those, the answer to those questions is yes, definitely. You can identify your top groups because when, you're, when you have one result on one animal, you're looking at 74% reliability. But if you apply that to a group of 100 head or 300 head, or a thousand head, you can sort those to find your best performers for certain traits. So if we go to the next slide and you see, you compare, compare the performance of groups of genomic tested cattle at Anderson Dairy. So these are ones that uh, say are more than hundred days in milk. They have a genomic test on them. So if you wanna just look at fertility, the group that has positive DPR is 106 days open. The group that has negative DPR, 127 days open. So 21 different, 21 days difference in their days open uh, based off of their genomic prediction for fertility. And then you see the actual performance um, is true. You can do the same with somatic cell. Those that are above 2.95 somatic cell for their PTA had a 96 somatic cell at last test. The group that's below 2.95 somatic cell um, is 43. So uh, another big spread, do the same for production. I just picked pounds of fat. Those that are over 40 pounds of fat, 1206, uh, mature equivalent for fat versus 1175 for the ones below. So for predicting your top group of performers, um, genomic testing is highly accurate when applied to enough numbers. And you can use that to uh, decide, hey, which animals am I gonna breed to make replacements? Which animals are we gonna sell? Which animals are we gonna breed to make uh, calves for, uh, you know, for a beef program, something like that. So here at, uh, on our dairies, Anderson Dairy and Seagull Bay Dairy, we have a mixed herd of Holsteins and Procross. The Procross uses the Montbilliard and the Viking Reds along with the Holsteins. Um, you know, uh, we've seen with hybrid vigor, we've seen uh, pretty good improvements, especially in the health traits. Um, although now we are seeing the Holsteins make big improvements in health traits and they're, they're uh, starting to close that gap quite significantly between the Procross and the Holsteins uh, because of the, the good work of, uh, of breeders who have been selecting for health traits in the Holstein breed. Um, so we use only female sorted dairy sires and then we use conventional beef sires. Um, so we don't use any straws of uh, conventional dairy sires in our commercial herd. Um, we select sires based on net merit with the high emphasis on combined fat and protein and productive life. We use mostly young bulls, um, but we, we don't use too much of any one bull. Um, if we get a proven sire we really like, we will use a lot of that bull. But on, on genomic sires, it's really a good idea to not fall in love with just one bull, um, spread it out on the, on the young bulls. Um, our plan is we just, we use on the heifers uh, that are in the breeding pen, we go to sources with sexed dairy sires and then they'll go to beef if they're not pregnant at that time. And so 82% of our heifers are gonna calve being bred to uh, sexed female dairy sires. On the cow side, 
only 30% of our dairy cattle, our, our milking herd is bred to dairy sires and the rest is bred to uh, beef bulls. We're trying to manage our heifer inventory a little more carefully and to get the number of heifers we need for replacements. Uh, that's all it takes is 30%. And so we, we sort those based on performance and also genomic testing as to which ones are going to be bred uh, dairy or beef. Um, so, so how does selecting for uh, high production and high fitness, how, how, what changes have we seen? Here's just four years of data. Um, if you look at pregnancy rate, um, we've got uh, in 2020, we had a 39% pregnancy rate, uh, 2019, 38%. Back in 2017, it was 26%. Uh, there's more to that than just genetics. Uh, we have improved some of our uh, reproductive uh, protocols and things, but uh, and there's been a few months here in 2021 where we've achieved 40% uh, preg rate, and that's using all sexed semen on on the dairy sires we use. So the other thing we watch closely is what how, when are the cows leaving the herd. Um, if they leave in the first 60 days, you know, we call that, uh, you know, leaving during the transition period. So in 2020, we had 3% of the coals were there or 3% of the cattle that calved left the herd within the first 60 days. Uh, 2019 was uh, 4.7, 2018, 7.2. Uh, didn't have the data available from that 2017 year, but uh, energy corrected milk too, we've, we've seen a pretty good movement from 2017 to 2020 um, you know currently we're right around that 90 pounds energy corrected milk and that's up that's up about four four to five pounds from from uh, three years ago and so you know genetics is certainly contributing to that um, I would say you're, you will get what you select for but then of course you've got to uh, you've got to improve in management as well and so uh, some of the improvements we've seen in production and in reproduction are, are certainly from, from better management practices. Uh, we're trying to be a little more careful of wit, at what weight we calve in the fresh heifers. Um, you know, we used to try to get that 22 to 23 age at first calving. Now we, we target a 24 month age at first calving. And uh, we want those cattle to be 95% of their mature weight prior to calving. And uh, we do track that and, and we've, been able to, uh, we've been able to get that uh, size of heifer before calving. And, and I think that's helped as well with the production side. We also try to have, uh, you know, we target 30% or less first lactation heifers. We're not in a growth mode right now for uh, milking more cows. And so what we want is an older herd. We want more of these second, third and fourth lactation animals. And so uh, instead of having, uh, you know, 38 to 40% two-year-olds in the herd, um, we'd actually love to get down to 25% two-year-olds um, here in the next year to two. Um, and the way you do that is by, you know, having less involuntary coaling. And to do that, you've got to have healthy and fertile cattle. So um, those, are, uh, those are some of the things we've seen in performance. Um, if you want some of my final thoughts here, um, one is genetic selection works. You will get what you select for. Um, and for us, um, fat and protein plus longevity and fertility, that's what we're after. Um, Genomic predictions are very reliable when they're applied to groups of cattle. And so uh, that's an important thing to realize when you're talking about uh, genomic predictions. And that we do know that a cow will produce well while maintaining healthy body condition. And that's the kind of cow that, uh, that we want to replicate. And, and they have shown to be the top performing animals in, in our herd and so. Uh, some of the traits, you know, I think coming up that'll be more important, uh, feed efficiency, number one, I think that's really the, the selection tool for the future. 
is we've got to identify these cattle that are the most efficient at converting feed into growth and feed into uh, pounds of fat and protein. And so I commend the work that's being done by various uh, organizations to help identify those cattle. Um, hoof health, I think, is very important, uh, as well as disease resistance. The casings, it's great. We can identify those. And then polled, um, I think uh, there's been a lot of good progress in the polled uh, trait for the Holstein cow and, uh, you know, a few more generations and, and there will be a lot better selection there. Um, we do need to uh, watch for inbreeding. I think Don brings up a good point. Um, like I said, the, we, we, we're already doing some crossbreeding. We have for a long time. But the Holstein breed has really closed the gap in a lot of these health and utility traits. And so I commend the work done there with the Holstein breed, but we are gonna have to uh, protect ourselves a little bit against uh, too much inbreeding. Although I think uh, really the test is, are you still able to improve performance? And we've still been able to do that in the Holstein breed. And so as, as long as performance continues to improve, um, I think we're pretty safe. But uh, the warning that we hear from Don is, is well, well taken. So uh, there's my last slide. And uh, thank you uh, for this chance to present today. Thank you, Greg. Next up is Alicia Lamb. Alicia assists with management of the Show and Genomic Index Program at Lamb Farms Incorporated, Oakfield Corners Dairy. This includes all aspects of marketing, social media, advertising, showing, sales, mating, bull contracts, you name it, she does it. Alicia is on the New York State Dairy Promotions Organization Board and is a past president of the New York Holstein Association and National Dairy Shrine. She served as a volunteer with many youth organizations, including National Holstein Women's Scholarship Organization and local 4-H and Holstein clubs. Alicia is on the Holstein USA's Qualified Judges list and has officiated shows in multiple states, Japan and Korea. She has spoken about the farm's genetics program to dairy farmer groups in China, Canada, and multiple states in the U.S. Alicia graduated from the University of Florida with a degree in animal science in December 1996. She was a nutrition and management consultant in Western New York with nearly 20 years before returning to the family farm full time. With her husband, Jonathan, she was recognized as the 2012 Holstein USA Distinguished Breeder and the 2012 New York Young Holstein Breeder. She lives in Oakville, New York with Jonathan, daughter Kira, and son Griffin. Welcome, Alicia. Hi, thank you for having me today. I, uh, I'm very honored to be a part of this uh, panel today, especially with the other breeders that are involved. I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about the farm and the lamb family. Um, my husband, Jonathan, and his brother, Matthew, are the 12th generation in the lamb family to farm. So farming has been in their blood for hundreds of years, as far back as we could uh, trace in their gene genealogy. Lamb Farms, as it sits today, was established in 1966 by Jonathan's dad, Gordon, and his grandfather, Leslie. Uh, the state of New York, through eminent domain, purchased the farm, and it's now, that original uh, facility was used as a state park. So they moved to Oakfield, began milking with about 110 cows at the time. The Lamb family is always focused on cow health and well-being, which has allowed for uh, tremendous levels of internal herd growth. And that growth has accounted for about 90 plus percent of the herd growth that you'll hear about here in a minute over the years. Currently, Lamb Farms is milking on four facilities, two in Oakfield, one in Wilson Lakeshore Dairy, which is about an hour north of us, and then one in Western Ohio. Um, the three farms in Western New York are shipping milk to upstate Niagara, which is a local cooperative, and out in Convoy, Ohio, they're shipping to Dannon. The focus uh, for all four farms has been on quality milk, high components and high production levels. And all four farms are averaging between 90 and 100 pounds of milk of 4% fat, 3.1 to 3.2% protein with low somatic cell score and low bacteria counts. I just quickly wanted to do an overview of the four operations. So Lamp Farms 1 is the main facility of the original home farm that was purchased in 1966. Uh, currently they're milking about 2,300 cows 
They milk in a 60 stall Westphalia Surge Rotary Parlor that was built 20 years ago this month. And they do have a methane digester at this farm and that is going into natural gas. Farm two was purchased in 1998 and it's the farm that Jonathan and I spend the majority of our time on. Uh, through some expansion over the years, we're milking about 1400 cows here. And five weeks ago tomorrow, uh, we began milking in a 72 stall GEA Pro-Q robotic rotary parlor. Uh, the technology is fabulous and we're still training the cows and the people, but it's uh, for the most part, it's going well. By the end of the year, uh, we have another barn that's in construction and by the end of the year, we'll be milking about 2,800 cows at this facility. Additionally, at Farm 2, uh, my background uh, starting out was showing cows. So we do have a genetics barn with capacity for about 28 show cows at any one time. It's a very simple four stall step up pipeline parlor uh, with 14 bedded packs. Also at Farm 2, we do raise all of our show calves and heifers up to about a year of age. All calves and heifers, uh, with the exception of our show calves, are moved to a central calf raising facility in Oakfield. And there's about 1,300 calves here from day one up to six months of age at any one time. Lakeshore Dairy was purchased in 2009 when market prices were quite low. It was a facility that had been uh, sitting empty for a few years. So with a few minor upgrades, uh, the family was pretty quickly able to uh, get cows milking in that facility. Currently, they're milking about 1,900 cows here, and all heifers and calves are raised on site up to about 10 months of age. There is a methane digester that was installed two years ago, and again, uh, that methane is going into the natural gas pipeline. Convoy Dairy was the most recent purchased in September of 2016. The family was looking for a new milk market at the time as our local cooperative had uh, implemented some restrictions on growth at the farms here in Western New York. So through some expansion over the past few years, they're now milking 1900 cows. And again, uh, calves and heifers up to about 10 months of age are raised on site in Ohio. All heifers from seven to 10 months, depending on the location, uh, and up to pre-calving are raised at a central heifer raising facility here in Western New York. It's just north of the original home farm in Oakfield. And there's about 3,500 head on this facility at any one time. All of our elite donors are housed on site here and they're flushed here as we do have our own ET facility and flush lab right there at the farm. As far as our cropping operation, uh, there is a non-family partner that's involved uh, the VZ family, they've been involved in the operation since the mid 70s and he and his family manage all of the crops and manure. So it's a nice partnership where the lamb family manages the cows and the VZs manage the crops and manure. Overall, there's about 12,000 acres of land. All of the cropping is done mostly in house with some custom harvesting uh, for those exterior locations. Uh, we do corn for corn silage, some dry corn, some high moisture shell corn, haylage, dry hay, and wheat for both straw and bedding. So moving on to our genetics program, it's something that Jonathan and I began a little over 20 years ago uh, after we met. It's our passion. We love to work with good cows and it's, it's what excites us to come to the barns every morning. Our genetics program began with the show cows uh, and it's evolved over the years to include a greater emphasis on the index program. We do have a very strong ET program. Our focus is on the merit or the value of the donor dam, not necessarily on the parent average of the resulting calf. We have three full-time people that work with our ET program in-house. And in 2020, we implanted just over 7,500 embryos. Like I said, the majority of our program is index. Uh, just over 90% is an index program, about 5% show. And we do have some beef, uh, mainly Wagyu beef, uh, that we're beginning to work with. And that whole marketing strategy is in its infancy, so we're excited to figure out where that's going to lead us. We do some conventional flush, but over the years have uh, recognized the need to reduce the age of our donor dams to keep generation interval minimalized. And uh, so we've converted to more of an IVF flush program with uh, both Transova and Bovitech coming to the farm to do that. 
And we do some implants in mature cows, mostly for our show calves due to calving ease and mostly heifers. I wanted to touch on our show program for a moment. Uh, again, this is how we began our genetics program. It was the genesis of it all. And it's something that we're very, very proud of, the evolution of the program over the years. Um, and it is a well-established market for us. Um, the great thing about our show program is that we've been able to attract some high quality people to the farm today because let's be honest, that's where a lot of us have gotten our start in the industry and that's where the passion for this uh, generates. So we're very fortunate that we're able to have this show program to keep those people involved in the farm and to keep us moving forward as a whole. As we look at the breeding program of the farm uh, in general, the goal is to breed cows that we want to work with. We work in the barns every day. We help milk the cows every day. And when we go through the barns, we want to look at cows that we like to see. Um, in addition, we want cows that are attractive to other breeders and that are marketable to other breeders. So when we look at our breeding program our commercial cow on our commercial cows, we use some of the Holstein programs to help manage inbreeding uh, and as well as uh, a functional type trait mating program as well to watch those inbreeding levels and to make sure that we're breeding for functional traits. About 40% of the lactating herd is bred to beef, again, mainly Wagyu and some Angus, uh, while the higher end GTPI heifers and higher end young heifers are bred to sex semen. We do believe in a diversity of pedigrees and diversity of cow families. That's something that uh, is very strong to us, a very important part of our program. So with our high genomic index program, or while we are using those highest available GTPI and net merit bulls that we can get our hands on, we're watching for pedigree diversity significantly. We do have a working relationship with a few studs and work with the sire analyst to ensure a, a profitable marketable mating for those bulls. As we look at our successes and challenges of the program, uh, it kind of ebbs and flows over time. Everyone has some of those, um, but we were very fortunate to have a great run with our female population in April. Um, we're, we are very, very fortunate and very proud of that fact. Um, selling the bulls to stud is something that we enjoy doing now. We uh, are very happy with the bulls that we sell to stud and we use them back in our own program. It's great to see some of those bulls that go on to be uh, sires of the next great donor dam or sires of the next great son as well. As far as challenges, they're always fun. Uh, the biggest uh, challenge that we try to overcome is identifying the bottlenecks in our system or areas of opportunity. So for example, a few years ago, we noticed the trend in the industry for younger age of donor dams, the need to reduce that generation interval. So while we had a great flushing program where our uh, donors that were 12 and 13 months old were just hitting it out of the ballpark and making all kinds of embryos and making all kinds of calves, we weren't necessarily uh, reaching our goals of having those high uh, index uh, parent average calves be born. So we learned that we needed to focus on a greater IVF flushing program and, and flush those heifers at five to six months of age. I think the greatest challenge that we are facing as an industry right now as breeders in the genetics industry is to recognize the playing field that we're on and how can we manage it to the best of our abilities. As we focus on the program moving forward for Oakfield Corners, we're gonna to continue to focus on mating for indexes rather than single traits. Um, our concern by focusing on a single trait is that we're gonna lose our focus or the goals of our overall program. And as long as the index includes the traits that we believe in, such as DPR, feed efficiency, production components, we're gonna be able to breed for those other traits that may be less heritable and maintain the same rate of genetic progress of our herd. Additionally, we don't wanna lose sight of some of the specialty traits and red carriers, poles, higher type, some of the A2A2 slick traits. Uh, those are all traits that are important to a certain segment of breeders. And 
for the importance of us to maintain that well-rounded program. We don't want to lose sight of that moving forward. Flexibility is huge. We've got to remain flexible, learn to adapt to the changing environment, otherwise we'll become obsolete. I think one of our greatest successes, maybe I should have put it in my successes and challenges slide, is the team of people that we're working with now. And we have to maintain uh, and be able to surround ourselves with a talented group of people. The, they share a passion for working with good cows and breeding great cows like we do. So we need to maintain that engagement among our team so we can remain successful long-term. Costs and economics. The genetics program has to pay for itself. If it doesn't, our partners and our lenders will not allow us to continue, quite frankly. So uh, we really have to watch our costs and make sure that uh, everything is in line there. And then finally, we've got to make sure that we're watching the progress and we're meeting the goals of our genetics program as we move forward and doing what we need to do to ensure that. With that, I look forward to the discussion at the end of our uh, presentations. And again, thank you for including me on the panel. I love working and, and talking with other breeders. So this is a great experience. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Our final presenter today is Mark Butts. Mark is a managing partner in Genosource LLC, and he has a long history within the dairy industry. He started his career with Purina, working his way to regional sales manager of seven Midwest states. After 20 years with the company, he decided to head out on his own and founded Dairy Consulting Services, a nutrition and management company, which he ran for 10 years. Mark then co-founded both Heifer Exchange and Genetic Futures, two dairy businesses focusing on advancing dairy genetics, until he became a managing partner of Genosource in 2014. Genosource, located in Blairstown, Iowa, is a large dairy that focuses on creating new genetics for the modern dairy producer. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, Genosource uh, is really a culmination of a lot of things for, uh, I think, a great group of people, a great group of uh, dairymen with the common goal to make a better cow and to seek the truth in genetics. Um, Genosource was established in 2014. And, and really, it was a very simple uh, beginning. Uh, it was an extension of some friends that we that I had had with Tim Rowan, Bill Rowan, the Farnier Group, Pat Carroll, uh, Bill's and, and Tim's families. Um, and uh, we decided to jump into this thing because we'd had some early success. So anyway, it was established in 2014, Genosource Milks. Um, about 3,000 cows. Today, we're a little above that, a 3X on a 60-stall rotary. Uh, we run a very, very intensive uh, IVF and flush program. Um, we have uh, all cows are milked through a rotary. Like I said, 58% of the herd is first lactation cows. And that really is a, an offshoot and a result of our intensive flush program and our focus on breed-leading genomics. Uh, like I said before, our team uh, and, and have become friendships and partnerships and lifelong associates, uh, myself, Tim Rowan, Pat Carroll, uh, Tom and Rick Simon of Farnier Holsteins. Kyle Dimmer is on board with us today. Kyle is from Leo Lal Holsteins, Matt Simon. Uh, Cruz Delgado does an awesome job as our farm manager. Amanda Hawk takes care of most of our registrations and our our day-to-day -day, uh, busy work on the computers, which you guys can all see I'm not very good at. But uh, to say they're a great team for me is a, is a really understatement to the efforts and, and time and devotion that this, this group of people put into a common goal, uh, and that being of GenoSource. Um, as far as sales and the goals for GenoSource and what we do, um, you know, you have, when you're in the high end genomic and um, you uh, have to promote your own image, you have to promote your own cattle or your way of thinking. And uh, we do this through sales of GS auctions as an offshoot of GenoSource. Um, we manage two or three sales a year. This last year wasn't very advantageous because of the COVID-19. Um, we're all breathing a sigh of relief, hoping that 2022 and 21 will even be better than it has been in the past. 
uh, international opportunity sale takes uh, place every year at the World Dairy Expo, as well as our spring gen genetic fiesta sale. And both those sales have been in the top uh, grossing and averaging uh, sales for um, quite a few years here. So as far as our breeding program goals, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll venture a bit off of the beaten path as far as uh, what I put on the slide here, but uh, in our whole focus all along has simply been to seek the truth. And the truth is in our business that the majority of the cows in our country and around the world are milked in a, a parlor type setup, whether it be a rotary or a parallel, parabone or what have you. But the cows live in a freestall environment where they walk on cement, they get pushed um, from the pens to the parlor, um, they eat in a headlock and they eat a TMR. So with those things in mind, our production system in this country is pretty well focused. Uh, like most of the guys on, and ladies, Alicia, on, on, the, on our webcast today have, have noted that we also are net merit focused. Um, some of our breeding goals, not all of them, but we're breeding for a little smaller body size and of course, productive life. Um, our whole goal here is to have those cows be the, the best in the environment in which they live. And that environment is truly a freestyle environment. Um, our, our happiest cows, our trouble-free healthy cows are the cows that we don't even pay any attention to. We, uh, they don't show up on a sick list. They don't get mastitis. They uh, get bred, they come back in and, and we don't pay a lot of attention to them. And I think that's really the important part of our uh, group housing uh, and the way that we manage cattle. But one thing I would like to touch base on, and I think uh, almost everybody talked about it before me, was uh, I think the biggest hurdle in our industry right now is, is to capture the truth in our feed efficiency. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of work. It's, uh, it's moderately a heritable, heritable trait, but uh, if we can capture the truth and with data and backup data and linear breeding toward that, um, I believe that that will be the saving, um, not the saving grace, but, but certainly the, uh, the golden ring of dairy cattle and, and milking cows. Um, takes up a lot of energy, a lot of expense, and those cows that produce more milk on less feed and maintain their body weight and get bred are those the most profitable cows within the herd. Like I said, we run a very intensive uh, IVF flush program. Um, our breeding program, quite honestly, is uh, our top 0.01% of our uh, genomic donors. Uh, we run about 40 a week um, and implant 150 embryos. We export and have a, a viable market in Japan. Uh, export about 100 to 150 embryos a month. We uh, calve in about 3,500 3, calves. Um, and like most of the people on the panel, we do breed uh, most of the cows get bred Angus and most of the heifers get bred sex semen Holstein. Um, I think when we look at it, uh, Greg mentioned a few things on his cast that uh, has some favorite cow families and things that have uh, done well for them like ours. Uh, Delicious was a, was a huge gift for Geno Source. Um, she enjoyed a long career, 10 years old last week, and uh, we're still flushing her. We think she still has some, some gas in the tank as far as to, to bring us some new, new uh, high calves. Ruby, um, dam of Rubicon, uh, passed away, but uh, she left a lasting mark in our herd. And then the new one, of course, the Men Ahead family, um, and that produced a bull named Captain, which was number one genomic bull on the April run. And so the breed program has been focused on net merit. Uh, we've achieved some goals that we have for ourselves. And uh, 
we enjoy a, a really good relationship with uh, ST as we are um, we are with those guys as far as selling our genetics to them on the bull side um, and have had a really good relationship with those guys so um, appreciate uh, you know the focus that they've put in but also the focus that our group has put in and and uh, I guess there's there's one manta here at uh, we talked about it the other day was uh, we've always said to keep our foot on the gas genomically reach out diversify um, and see which of our cow families push that mating through to the highest level and focus on those. I guess uh, for achievements, um, we had a really good April uh, proof run. Um, just some, I guess just some um, highlights for the herd. Um, Captain's number one genomic young sire. Uh, a lot of sons and daughters uh, rank in the top list right now. Um, as far as the herd is concerned, uh, I broke it down. Uh, we have 136 uh, head over 3,000 GTPI. We have uh, 507 over 2,900 GTPI. And the 2,800 GTPI with 20, 1274 and right at 3,000. 2361 over 27. Like I said, we're net merit driven. We have uh, 46 over 900, 470 over 800, and 1446 over 700. So, with 58% of our herd being uh, two year olds, uh, we know that uh, from the production side, uh, we're not quite as high as we need to be uh, as far as. Uh, a commercial dairy to make milk on on the feed and in efforts, but um, we're very happy where we're at genomically. Um, we enjoy um, our relationship with ST. Uh, have a ton of respect for everybody else out there. Uh, we're just very happy doing what we're doing, and I have to give all the credit in the world to, to Tim and Matt, and Kyle, and Amanda and Cruz and and uh, our owners for their unwavering support and dedication to GenoSource. Um, so that's really about all I've got. Thank you, Mark. So a few questions as we round out our webinar today. Uh, and I think I'll start with you, Don. Thousands of producers have worked hard for generations to improve the genetics of their herds. How were you able to separate yourself as providers of elite genetics? We had, as we, we moved uh, here to Florida uh, 40 years ago, and uh, as we expanded the herd here from 125 cows, uh, we tended to very frequently buy whole herds to get cow families. And, uh, really put that emphasis on uh, cows that seem to be consistent transmitters. And when uh, genomics came along, we were an early player and uh, had, uh, uh, it, it let us sort those families uh, uh, that uh, we had uh, developed. Uh, it was sometimes a little hard to know which were the really superior ones, uh, uh, but uh, genomics uh, straighten that out quite fast. How about you, Greg? I'm curious on everyone's answer to this. How were you able to separate yourself as provider of elite genetics? Well, I mean, I think uh, for us, you've, we, we've had to adapt. Um, you know, the, the genetics changed a lot, you know, 12 years ago when, when genomic technology came in and um, really we've had to just continue to adapt. I mean, this partnership with Windstar Genetics is an adaptation from what we were doing before from Siegel Bay Dairy. Um, but really you've got to, you've got to try to be diverse enough, um, have enough uh, cow families that, uh, that perform well to where you can uh, continue to uh, 
to have the, the top end genetics. And then you also still have to invest. You have to invest in other cow families um, in order to, uh, I mean, be, be focusing on the traits and the cow families that work. So, and then the other part of it today is you have to navigate the new rules um, that come in with, from the AI companies too. I mean, let's just be honest with that too. I mean, it's, it's not like it was 10 years ago or five years ago. And so partnerships with uh, AI organizations and how do you manage those partnerships? I think that's, uh, that's an important part because you, you wanna try to maintain some independence while still maximizing um, the value from partnerships in the industry. So um, those are the waters we're in and we're continually trying to adapt. And, uh, and so that's how we've, I think, been able to uh, stay competitive with our genetic level. Um, and our partnership with WinStar involves uh, four different dairies and, and three different owners and uh, a lot of good people. And so um, we've grown and adapted and, and managed partnerships. And so that's, uh, that's how we've tried to stay competitive in the genetics business. Alicia? Yeah, so I agree a lot with what uh, Greg and Don said. Um, the biggest thing for us is that we've always tried to remain true to breeding cows that we like to work with. We like to focus on the pedigree diversity uh, different cow families were big believers in that. And we feel if we're going to use the bulls that we produce back in our own program, then hopefully other breeders will as well. Uh, that's, that's just our, our truth. Um, at the same time, you know, we can't lose sight and focus of those goals. So we have to make sure that we're adapting so we're not left behind. Uh, probably one of the biggest drivers of our success and the biggest drivers of our business are the people that we work with. Um, I, I mentioned it in the presentation, you know, we've got a tremendous talented team here at the farm and without them sharing that same passion and without them being dedicated to the breeding program, uh, like Jonathan and I are, like Jonathan and I are, we would not have any success at all. And Mark, how were you able to separate yourself as a provider of elite genetics? From the standpoint of, uh, you know, we spent a lot of money, uh, Buying cattle, different, different um, spend certainly a lot of money on a uh, multiplying it with uh, embryo transfer, um, and I think we've been a little lucky over the years with some purchases. But I do believe that there is a common goal that all of us have talked about: is living and working with the kind of cows that you like. And I think most of us like the same kind of cow. I don't, that's not really hard to say, but it, it but it's, it's, it's really kind of true. Um, and then just go after it and find out what cow and cow families push their genetics through every mating. And I think that's what, uh, that's what Delicious taught me a long time ago, that she dominated those matings. And we bred her to how many different bulls and flushed her to how many different sires but yet she drove that mating. And when you find those cow families, um, and we all have them, and those are the ones that you really need to multiply and complement with your matings. I don't know if we've given up anything. We may have, I may have, I can't speak for everybody else here, but I, I used to really like the show cows, and I really still do like the show cows. Um, but I certainly love and respect a really, really good commercial cow that has no business in the show ring. But for us, I think uh, without babbling, I think it's really about those cow families that can push their genetics through most matings that you do with them and come out and really improve the breed as far as genomically is concerned. So let's talk about branding and identity. Obviously, developing elite genetics is important. You are all well known in the dairy industry, but it's not much good if no one knows about it. So how have you gone about developing and marketing your own brands and identity? Uh, we uh, have uh, probably leaning less than the other uh, for the studs, but probably uh, uh, my adversity to inbreeding cut some of that off. 
But in the meantime, uh, we had uh, each year were raising 1,500 to 2,000 bulls, at least ended up on the ground that we had genomic data from. And uh, those bulls, we have found a good uh, uh, commercial outlet of large uh, uh, dairies and uh, uh, they leave here by the possum belly load, usually uh, uh, close to breeding age uh, and uh, because of some cow expansion, we're not uh, raising as many as we were, uh, but the demand is still there for the bulls. We're probably now marketing five to 700 bulls a year to these outlets where it probably peaked at about uh, 2,000. So that, uh, uh, but, uh, and, and a lot of the rest is, is just, uh, uh, communications uh, uh, with the groups of folks like uh, we're having right now and we happen to be an area of the world uh, except for last year where uh, people are traveling our direction anyhow and dad's getting a little tired of uh, Mickey Mouse and things and so they come up and see the cows. Those would be uh, uh, the the, where we would have our most contacts. Alicia, how about you? So when we began our breeding program 20 something years ago, nobody knew who Oak Hill Corners was. Uh, <laughs> we were the big nobodies in the market. Uh, we made some strategic purchases through the years. And as such, we began a strong marketing and advertising program and a lot of different uh, publications uh, just to get our names out there. Uh, obviously, with the way that that industry has gone, we've pushed uh, more heavily on social media in the past few years. Um, another thing that we always did, I think that made us unique at the time, was we always sold our best animals on the farm. Uh, of course, originally it was our show cows. We always sold the best ones, which I hated to do, but we did it. And I think that that uh, left buyers the uh, impression that you know we were honest with what we were doing. We had uh, we always stood behind the cattle that we sold. So uh, over the years, you know, we always sold our highest uh, genomic animals, uh, i.e., delicious, <laughs> and a few others through the years there that have gone on to do fabulously for other people, and we're so excited that they've had, that they've had that success with those individuals. Um, but of course, we don't sell our females anymore. Uh, Greg touched on it there a minute ago due to market uh, contract restrictions as they are today. So uh, our goals with our branding program and with our marketing program is to brand our females. It's easy with the show side. With the genomic side, we're trying to brand cow families and, and, and push that whole cow family concept um, through the bulls going into stud. And we do have some embryo contracts uh, as well overseas. So, um, I guess basically trying to be as honest as possible with our breeding and with the animals that we sell is, is how we've tried to establish that marketing concept through the years. And last question of the day, and I'll work my way to you, Greg and Mark, on this one. What's the cow of the future look like to you? I'll start with you, Greg. Well, I think, uh, I mean, we, I showed some pictures in my slides there and things, but I mean, the for, for dairy producers, the cow of the future is, is going to be uh, continue to give more pounds of fat and protein and, and going to have uh, uh, even higher ability to, uh, to live longer and breed back. And so I see just a cow that is going to be more and more profitable. That's what we're selecting for. The way she looks, I think in general, is going to be she's going to be white in the front white in the back she's going to maintain body condition and uh you know she's going to be um very uh user friendly i guess is the way you you'd say it and so um i think that's the the cow of the future and uh i think that uh we what we select for is what we're going to get and so uh I'm excited for, for what's happening in our herd. That's really what I think genetics is about. 
um, is getting out in the barn every day, working with cows. Um, and you see, you see what genetic selection really can do for you um, by being with the cow and working with the cow. And, uh, and that's really the, the funnest part of genetics is to see how the whole herd can improve uh, through uh, a disciplined genetic plan. And uh, so that's, uh, that's what we see and that's, that's why we do what we do. I would echo a lot of what Greg said. He's a smart guy and they do a great job up there. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to really be able to add a whole lot onto Greg, obviously, with the longevity portion of it. Those cows have got to be able to get up and down to the feed, to the parlor, and back to their beds. Um, certainly got to be a high fertility kind of a cow um, to where she has multiple calves and she, she breeds back. Um, keeps her days of milk down, high components, of course. And, um, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revert back to the feed efficiency. I think our cow of the future is going to be the most efficient cow that, that creates, creates a value through her profitability of making milk by her efficiency. And how we get there, I don't have a map for success um, for there. I'll leave that to all the other smart people. But uh, we've got to get some real data on this. And I, and I think it's coming. I, I noticed that we did add a feed efficiency into our, into our formula this month, uh, this quarter. And uh, I know that it's a great attempt, um, but we have a ways to go on that. But I, I think that is the holy grail. And, and we're going to work really hard at GenoSource to get there. But, uh, yeah, I, I can't really add a lot to what Greg said. So that's what I think is going to happen. Well, my thanks to our presenters today for joining us and sharing their invaluable expertise and experience. Don't forget to subscribe to the Bova News channel on YouTube. Find our Bova News podcast on your favorite listening platform and find more information at bovanews.com. Thanks for tuning in with us today and we'll see you next time on another edition of Bova News.